Welcome to Life on Planet Earth with John Aiden Byrne. It's definitely artificial. I mean, think about it. People, if they lose their jobs, they're getting a check from the United States government for $600 every week. In, in many cases, that's more money than they earn because on top of that $600, they're getting their unemployment check, right? So they're earning more money today than they would earn if they were working. So, so the net effect is that's not realistic. That's not a real economy. That's artificial. If you take a look at the money supply, the money supply of the United States is now growing at a 25% rate year over year. We've never had that happen. A voyage of discovery in an uncommon age of unparalleled scientific, economic, political, and social upheaval, life on planet Earth searches for the unvarnished truth, answers, solutions, and above all, hope for our existential crisis. My guest coming up is the stuff of legend. He's the bank industry analyst, Dick Beauvais of Odeon Capital. That was Dick a moment ago, sharing his worst fears about the economy and our escalating money supply in the US. Question is, what happens the morning after? What happens when the Fed has to stop printing this money and the economy still hasn't recovered? It could get very ugly, yeah. After five decades on the job, Dick Beauvais is one of the most quoted and recognized bank industry analysts on Wall Street. He's been described as an industry gadfly, a cantankerous maverick, and a whole lot more. But he's never boring, and he's often controversial. I'm your host, John Aiden Byrne. No word in the English language is less convincing than probably. Are you sure we should get matching tattoos on our first date? Sure. Um, we'll probably stay together. Probably? <laughs> it's been 23 minutes since I ate. I can probably swim. Uh, you should wait 30 minutes. Mm, okay, now tell me what to do. Cannonball! <laughs> cramp! Oh, I have a cramp. I can probably hit the green from here. Probably. Can I get a mulligan? Ready to go? Hey, are you sure you're okay to drive? Yeah, I'm pretty sober. Yeah, I'm probably okay. Probably okay isn't okay, especially when it comes to drinking and driving. If you're drinking, call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. Well, it's just grand to have you back. I'm your host, John Aiden Byrne, and my guest is Dick Beauvais, an amazing bank analyst at Odeon Capital. I say that because he has very deep insights that stretch back five decades and his outlook on today's banking industry and the economy generally is worth listening to. I must warn you, Dick pulls no punches on his worst fears for the US economy and the US dollar. He explains why this might be a bit of a phony baloney economy and why he thinks the Fed may actually be violating its own charter to save America. I first asked Dick for his overall take on the banking sector as he warmed up for his three case scenarios on the bank sector. The best, middling and the worst. We've had some real problem with bank stocks going back to 2017. In other words, um, the COVID uh, impact has been clear on the industry, but I really think there are deeper problems and that, and that those problems surfaced, uh, as they say, three years ago, because bank stock prices have, in fact, declined over the last three years. Not only have they declined, but they have underperformed every move in the market, whether it's up, down, or sideways. 
so the question that I've been dealing with um, is what really is causing th these deep difficulties? I've come to four conclusions. The, the first one, you know, is that the banks are mismanaging their capital accounts. In other words, they're not reinvesting um, much more than 1% of their profits each year into th their businesses. And that slows down their secular growth rates. And to the degree that they reduce, you know, some of the biggest banks have actually paid out more than they've earned. To the degree that they reduce the size of their common equity, they're reducing their current earnings. The second problem, obviously, is they have no control over pricing. If you take a look at every product that a bank sells, and I don't care if it's loans or asset management or wealth management or investment management or even the uh, protection and movement of funds, which would be administrative activities, every one of the prices in every one of those areas have gone down and the banks cannot do anything to stop it. The third problem is, you know, basically they had reduced their cost of operation dramatically from the bad days in 2008, 2009, 2010, basically because they were getting rid of people and those people had been hired to deal with bad mortgages, bad loans, bad what have you. Um, and, the, and the fourth problem, which of course is always the biggest one, is that the banks are now dealing with the probability of an increase in loan losses. I mean, loan losses have been creeping up over the last three years. The reductions in the allowance, which get added to earnings, have been eliminated. They're now adding, you know, reserves again. So the loan loss issue is a big one. So I think I think the industry has four serious problems that have nothing to do with COVID, have been exacerbated by COVID, and which is causing these stocks to act in a in a, in a abysmal fashion. So there are pre-existing problems prior to COVID, and now COVID have made things even more challenging for the banking sector. Absolutely. And um, the problem, you know, that we're dealing with is, you know, we don't have a clue as to what's going on with anything. In other words, in, in my view, we are in what I would call a synthetic economy. I call it a synthetic economy because the Federal Reserve has stepped in and provided massive amount. They've actually provided $2.9 trillion in additional money you know, over the last four months, all right? Uh, so they, they've flooded the, the markets, the economy with money, and they flooded it with money at very, very low cost, right? The interest rates are pretty close to zero on the Fed funds or the overnight, uh, over the night rates. The, the government has stepped in and provided money to people who were working, you know, the thousand dollars each person got. Uh, and for people who are unemployed, the $600 a week. So, so the net effect is, you know, we, we, we don't know what's going on in the economy. Uh, I don't, I, I, I don't believe the employment numbers. And the reason why I say I don't believe the employment numbers, it gets kind of very wonky because only two out of the three people who make telephone calls for the you know, Labor Department to find out if you're working or not working, uh, they're there, but one third are not there. And the two out of the three are working from home. So the source of the data is bad. Seasonally adjusting factors that they use on the data are no good because we don't have a, a period of time to, you know, know what the seasonal adjustment should be in this environment. And there, there are even more crazy stuff like, you know, these people have to estimate how many companies opened up during the COVID period and how many companies closed down. And they can't do it, in, in my view. And therefore, I don't believe the employment numbers. The money numbers, I don't believe them either. And the reason I don't believe them is because uh, we no longer, we, we redefined what money was back in 1980. And we no longer know things like, uh, you know, how much, you know, money is in commercial money market funds. That used to be part of the money supply. It isn't anymore. 
how many big ticket uh, deposits are made in banks used to be part of the money supply isn't anymore so 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 we're dealing blind right and and people who are buying you know stock right now are doing so because they have faith that the economy will recover sharply they have a belief that all of the money being put in by the fed and and the government will work you know i'm i'm unfortunately an old guy and therefore i'm not willing to jump until i do get some clear explanation of what's going on there's a couple of things the market is going strong and it could hit its record highs any day i think it's being driven by money <laughs> if you think about it the the federal reserve has increased the size of its balance sheet coincidentally by exactly the same amount that i said money grew 2.9 trillion dollars all right now that money is not going into you know growing the economy because the economy is shut down in many cases or operating it below uh, if you will potential in other cases but it's it the money is not going into the economy it is going in to the stock market it is going into the bond markets so the fed is producing this money this money is going directly into the purchase of financial assets and that's why every day the market goes up no matter what the news is you cannot think of an event anywhere in the world that could happen that will get the market to go down 1980 was a recession year 1980 was when uh, Paul Volcker was brought in uh, you know so he was brought in 79 um and what he did was he decided to kill the inflation that was occurring in the 1970s by running two back to back recessions and when he did that he was able to get control of inflation he was able to get control of interest rates and by 19 you know 84 85 interest rates were in a downswing and the market was clearly moving in the right direction he did not print money he he did the opposite we've never so interest rates in at that period were double digits right in the US yeah yeah the the interest rates were so so anybody that had a lot of cash potentially made a lot of money in that period if you're going back to to that period there were two back to back recessions the united states were economy was dealing with high interest rates increasing inflation and recession and his genius was he was able to gain control of the system and get interest rates to start going down break the back of inflation and after as i say these two back to back recessions you know he was able to get the the economy and the markets moving in the right direction again he may have made a lot of mistakes in my view in 2008 but in 1979-80 he he was magnificent you mentioned a synthetic economy so this is artificial uh... it's definitely it's definitely artificial i mean think about it i mean people if they lose their jobs they're getting a check from the united states government for $600 every week in in many cases that's more money than they earn because on top of that $600 they're getting their unemployment check right so they're earning more money today than they would earn if they were working so so the net effect is that's not realistic that's not a real economy that's artificial if you take a look at the money supply we have the money supply of the united states is now growing at a 25% rate year over year we've never had that happen for the average punter the average consumer who doesn't follow finance where do those sums of money start how did they get injected into the economy is it through the, the banking system and then it makes its way out how do, how does it work to put it in its simplest case the the US federal reserve buys treasury bonds mortgages and now it's actually buying loans you know from corporations so it's it it's creating the funds and then it's using the funds it creates to buy these different securities and and now loans which they never did before so that puts money directly into the hands of the sellers the sellers may be banks pension funds insurance companies 
they may be corporations, they may even be individuals. So the net effect is, in that fashion, the money moves from, if you will, the Fed into the economy. Now, once it gets into the economy, the holders of those funds, let's assume I sold, you know, $10,000 worth of treasuries to the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve has those treasuries. I've got $10,000 in cash. Now, the question is, what am I going to do with that $10,000? Am I going to go out and buy a car with it, which would be stimulating growth in the economy, or am I going to go buy stock with it, in which case I'm pushing the stock market up? Well, what we know, because it's been happening for the last four months, is the people who get this cash are using it to buy stocks, not to buy cars. So the net effect is the economy is not growing and the stock market is soaring. You now, mentioned ex- seven trillion on the Fed books. I've heard numbers as high as seven trillion by year end. The seven, the seven, that trillion. seven trillion. Are we going to? Are we headed in that direction? It's even going to be much substantially higher, even when everything is factored in. We're at slightly below seven trillion. And if you would go back just four months, we were at close to four trillion. So we've, so we've added, added those. That, that's where you came up with the two points. So yeah. Three. Okay. We've, we've been here before, though, Dick. You know, under Obama, coming out of the financial crisis, there was money printing as well, and we survived. That's what the critics will say. Well, it works. Or does it work in the long term? It's working right now. <laughs> but but the point is, even, even uh, during the Obama period, they didn't create as much money as they're creating right now. But anyway, it is working right now. I mean, people... People would be, we possibly would be in a depression without this, right? I mean, people are getting enough money. They can meet their bills. They can take care of their needs. Uh, and, and the economy has plenty of funds if anybody needs to borrow money to, if you will, facilitate the growth in, in a business, right? So the money is there. doesn't cost a lot. Income is there. It's being pushed by the government. And the question, and that's why I call it a synthetic economy, because this is not, it's not realistic. You can't grow the money supply at the rate of 25% per year. Otherwise, you're in Weimar, Germany, or you're in Zimbabwe. Uh, you just can't do that forever. And Could we go in that direction, that we could have a, a Weimar Republic, Zimbabwe, we Rhodesia produce, situation? If we're going to increase the money supply at 25% a year for a few years, yeah, obviously that's not acceptable. It just can't be done. The, 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 the hope of the people who are doing this is, look, we're, we're averting a depression. We're averting, you know, people, uh, in essence, having to do without funds, not being able to pay their bills. And we're hoping that because we put that money out there, people will go and spend it on something, doesn't matter what the heck it is. It could be clothes, it could be a movie, it could be shoes, it could be, you know, um, or television, computer, whatever. If they just go out and spend it, the economy recovers, it recovers aggressively, and this that becomes a bad memory, but nothing that, that is going to linger. On the other hand, if they don't spend it, if the money is used to pay down debt, uh, then basically... We don't know what's going to happen because the Fed, as I say, simply cannot produce money supply growth at the rate of 25% a year, which is what they've done to this point. You know, the, the, you know, if, if money supply is a complicated thing, but if you were to just look at checking accounts, checking accounts are growing at the rate of 50% a year. Can't do that because the economy is not growing at that rate. Checking accounts so, are growing at a rate of 50% a year. Yeah. What what does that really mean? I know I get the fifty percent, but what? It means why are they... more money in the checking account. Okay, right. It's it's, it's, it's cash. It, there's no interest on most accounts. Yeah, right? yeah. In other words, what's, what's happening is is people take that example. I sell my ten thousand dollars in treasuries to the 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 government. I get ten thousand dollars in cash. I decide not to use it for anything, so I put it in my checking account. So now there's ten thousand dollars sitting in the checking account, which everybody hopes that I'm going to spend to get the economy going. 
But if I don't spend it and I keep it in that checking account or I use it to pay down some debts that I have, then the economy is not going to grow. And then then we've got a major problem to deal with. I want to, in a moment, move to your forecasts for the banking sector and and lay out three scenarios, the best-case scenario, something in between, and the worst-case scenario. But before that, I just want to ask further on, uh, we have this national debt of $22 or or probably hitting 23 at this stage, and then the Federal Reserve debt. And people have raised alarms about this for years, and we have a national debt clock in New York City. It's like something that's going to explode, and it doesn't explode. But can you explain what the concern there is and when this whole thing could blow up? I mean, if there's no real productivity to retire that debt or not enough activity, isn't there some economic damage at some point and some significant damage? Well, you know, in 1972, when I started looking at banks, I I got into the business in 65. But in 1972, I was a financial analyst looking at the banking industry and the, the housing industry. And I went to my boss, a guy named Walter McConnell. I said, Walter, we can't live this way. The debt is growing much faster than the economy. It's 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 reaching a point where we can't pay for the debt. We're going to have a, a total collapse. And he said, well, he said, you know, I can't disagree with what you're saying about the debt and the the lack of income to pay, but it could collapse next year or it could collapse 20 years from now. All right, this is 19, this is now 2020, which is almost 50 years away from when I had that conversation. It's been a nice party since then. Yeah, but the point is, it it hadn't collapsed. And, and, And the Federal Reserve, not only has it not collapsed, but we're growing the debt at a faster rate than we've ever grown it before in terms of absolute terms. So so the net effect is I don't have a clue when this situation is going to stop. I know what will stop it. What will stop it if, if uh, people around the world simply say we don't want dollars anymore, that these dollars are, are causing uh, – you know, inflation. These dollars are not buying as many loaves of bread as it used as they used to buy, and and therefore um, we we don't want them. Once the world says that, the Fed can't print them. They have no value. They're useless, and that's when the thing stops. But we're nowhere near that. A simple example: When I was 17 years old, I went to the grocery store with my father. Bread cost at the time something like 20 cents a loaf, right? And my father was, if I can use the word bitching, about the fact that it cost 20 cents a loaf. I said, Dad, it's only 20 cents a loaf. He said, well, when I was your age, it cost two cents a loaf. Mm-hmm. All right, well, what does it cost today? It costs, you know, something on the order of uh, two bucks a loaf, maybe, depending upon what type of bread you want to buy. So if if you measure what's happened in loaves of bread as opposed to measuring it in dollars, you pretty much find that maybe the the increase in wealth is you know ephemeral. It's not really there uh, because you can't buy more loaves of bread today than your father bought or your grandfather bought in in prior years. So you know it, the system has been pumped up through the creation of dollars. The world is willing to accept those dollars, and as long as the world is willing to accept them, we'll keep printing them. And if we keep printing them, then, you know, we can run the system that we're running right now. When it's going to end, you know, I, I, as I, I repeat and I apologize, I have no idea. Okay, now let the adults get into the room. So you may have heard of modern monetary theory. It's a fancy concept for printing lots of money, Las Vegas style, and it's in fashion in many quarters. One of the ideas is that if things get out of hand, you can then raise taxes and tame inflation. Here's Dick Beauvais' take on it. Yeah, well, that's what we're doing, right? I mean, everybody argues that this is that this modern monetary theory is incorrect, that it's inappropriate, it's wrong, all right? So, okay, but that's what we're doing, and that's what we have been doing for decades. 
So if we've been doing it for decades, well, how can we say today mm. when, when some economist comes along and figures out, gee, this is what you've been doing, I'm going to write a book and explain what you've been doing and saying it's good because it's worked. How can you say it's no good since we've been doing it? As I say, we've been using debt as a method of increasing, uh, we'll say, incomes and perhaps economic activity. I, I, I don't know whether I buy the theory or not. But the bottom line is I do know that that's exactly what we've been doing. Are we going to see a spike in inflation at some point with all this money printing? I tell you, you would think so. I mean, how can you keep printing money and not growing the economy? I mean, the people with the money go to the car dealership and they say, how much does this Chevy cost? And the guy says, X amount of dollars, costs uh, you know, $15,000. But we don't have that many Chevys because we're not producing that many at the moment because of the slowdown in the economy. So, you know, another guy comes into the dealership and he says, I'll pay you 16000 for it. And so I now say, well, I'll pay you 17000 for it. In other words, if we're not going to increase output at the rate that we're increasing money supply, ultimately it has to result in inflation. Now, it hasn't to this point because of technological advances that are associated with the fourth industrial revolution, but... Um, Look on Google and say how fast can the fastest computer in the world go? They'll say they can do a quadrillion. They can do a, a quadrillion million uh, floating point operations in a second. Well, what the, yeah, that is speed so of light, or what, uh, yeah, extraordinary speed. It reduces the cost of, of of producing goods. That's a productivity gain. It's being measured. I mean. You know, take a look at your cell phone. How many functions are on that cell phone, uh, and and how how instantaneously are you getting those functions, you know, taken care of? Before we take a wee break and then pick up my interview with Odeon Capital's Dick Beauvais, I want to mention an an exciting event on July twenty third at eleven a.m. Eastern Time. I am joining a special panel along with other media folks hosted by Dr. Plamen Rusev and we'll be looking at the COVID crisis and sustainability. Check it out on virtual.webit.org, virtual.webit.org. And that's Webit Virtual. Why was the basketball court all wet? Because the players kept dribbling on it. <laughs> the dad joke. Corny, grown worthy, but also one of the simplest ways to share a moment with your kids. What did the buffalo say when he dropped his son off for school? Bye, son. <laughs> so take a moment to make your kid laugh because dad jokes rule. Make your kid laugh today. Go to fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. I just want to quickly go back to the U.S. dollar and then just start looking at your scenarios for the banking industry. The U.S. dollar being a reserve currency has to explain a lot of where we're at in the United States and why we're, I suppose, in an enviable position versus other economies. Yeah, you're exactly right. In other words, if this was Brazil and they tried to do this, they couldn't do it, right? Because there would be a massive inflation immediately in Brazil. You know, uh, having the reserve currency gives us an enormous benefit that virtually no other nation in the world has. Because as long as when people feel threatened, they want to own dollars, we can print them. We'll give them as many dollars as they want just by printing them. Other countries can't do that. Now, China, Russia, South Africa have created, if you will, their own currency, uh, Iran, North Korea. They are trying to get rid of the dollar as the global reserve currency and have the yuan, the Chinese currency, replace it. And, you know, I have no idea whether that's going to succeed or not, but it is impacting the ability of the dollar to maintain its primacy in the marketplace everywhere in the world. At the end of World War II, it was dollars or it was nothing. Today, 
you know, you can buy euros, you can use one, you can uh, use yen. But but the fact is that, that in times of stress, the only one you want is the dollar. If that ever stops, the United States has got big trouble. Most of the world's business transactions are done in U.S. dollars, right? A lot of the big Correct. deals, and I think it's like 65%. It's probably trending higher in the way things are under the COVID-19 restrictions and fears and mayhem out there. Yeah, well, the indication that most of the world's transactions are done in dollars is the price of oil is stated in dollars, right? The price of copper is stated in dollars. The value of trade is stated in dollars. So, you know, indicates that basically dollars are used everywhere. And what COVID has indicated that we've seen multiple times before in multiple situations is when there is stress in the international economy, people are not willing to take a chance on using some other currency or using their local currency. They want dollars. And and that's why the game that we're playing, increasing the money supply 25% a year, can't go on forever, is if we continue to do that, they won't say we want dollars. They so we want... would be debasing our currency if we yeah. do that. Right. I mean, the reason gold is soaring in price right here is because a number of people believe that the dollar will fall. The reason why you have Bitcoin is because people believe that the dollar will fall. So there is obviously hundreds of billions of dollars moving into other currencies or other forms of protecting the value of uh, good. But again, they, they keep growing in importance, but they have not they have not pushed the dollar off center stage and I'm I'm telling you if it is ever pushed off center stage the United States will have massive problems so how does that work just really quickly that somebody in Europe would exchange in their euros for dollars or somebody in Brazil exchange their local currency for dollars is that the phenomena yeah in other words if you take a look at the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve you will see that right now there is a uh, what they call a central bank swap mechanism and what the, what the what the Federal Reserve is doing is to make sure that uh, you know the Brazilian can have dollars is they swap dollars for the, the Brazilian currency the Federal Reserve has got swap agreements with you know central banks all around the world to make sure that there's plenty of dollars out there if they're needed or you can go to Citibank you know, Citibank is everywhere, and mm-hmm. Citigroup is everywhere in the world, and you can you can trade your currency for dollars. So ordinary you, individuals and big banks and treasury departments and corporations, they can all engage in those transactions worldwide. Well, that, well, the local right. currency for the U.S. dollar. I want to ask you, Dick, I'll throw this out at you. Is there anything the Fed is not really telling us? There's a lot of fear there among ordinary people. Gee, maybe we're on the precipice here or... Let's start putting money under the mattress. Is there any kind of agenda there that we're not aware of? Well, well I, I don't think so. I, I think that this Fed has been um, as clear as can be as to what the fears are of the people inside the Fed. They, 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 they've expressed that. I mean, Powell has expressed it clearly, repeatedly. You know, he's indicated that. There is need for the United States government to to loosen up its fiscal policy, which, of course, the government has done. He set up, I forget the number, 13 or or 12 or 13 what they call facilities, which are basically units which were created simply to pump money into the economy. Now, the the Fed has gone way, way out of its normal pattern of doing things to get money into the economy to prevent a significant downturn. Now, I, 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 you can be really hard put to come up with some negative statement about what the Fed is doing. I, I don't think you'll find an economist anywhere willing to do that. But there are unprecedented times, a little bit of an understatement here with what the Fed's doing. Well, I, th- I think so. I mean, we've never seen it before. In addition to which, it's questionable whether what they're doing is even legal. I mean, when they set up the charter for the Federal Reserve in 1913 and they adjusted it in the 1930s, they didn't 
say that the Fed could buy loans, you know, just something that the Fed has decided that it can do to assist the economy and it's going to do it. But I don't, I, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a Fed scholar, so I, I can't tell you that it's illegal, but I, I really question whether the Charter of the Federal Reserve of the United States allows it to do what the Fed is doing right now, but nobody's complaining because they need the Fed. We need the Fed to do what it's doing. Well, it's the last tool left out there in this difficult economy and difficult times we're in. Federal Reserve interventions and central banks worldwide, they're they're saving us from total disaster. At the moment, they are, yeah. Uh, And, you know, the question is, what happens the morning after? Uh, What happens when, you know, the Fed has to stop printing this money and the economy still hasn't recovered? Could it get ugly? It could get very ugly, yeah. Like in what way, how how would it show itself? Well, let's assume, for example, that uh, all these people who are getting $600 a week and don't have jobs don't get $600 a week anymore. How do they pay their bills? Let's assume that interest rates, you know, jump to... uh, where they were in the 1970s uh, or halfway to where they were. So instead of having a federal funds rate, which is sitting at uh, almost zero, you know, the federal funds rate then gets close to 20%. How business is going to produce goods? So they won't be, because they won't be able to borrow money at, at a reasonable price because people don't have money to buy the goods. They, they can't borrow enough money to make the goods at the, those rates to sell them to these people who don't have the money to buy them. So, yeah, it could be horrendous. And in a scenario like that, we could see then a huge spike in unemployment if the unemployment rates are measured properly. Yeah, you'll, have, you'll have political upheaval. You'll have, uh, you, you might even have a war. Um, I mean, it, 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 you know, if you read the Bible, you go to the last chapter, <laughs> Revelation, you know, you get right. a feel for what could happen. Yeah, yeah, wars and rumors of wars. We'll get back to the, your forecast in a second, but just on that, the riots on the street, American streets triggered by the brutal lawful life of George Floyd, what a terrible tragedy. I, I, any of that related to the financial system and people being idle at home? I, it's not exactly a banking question, but bankers would w- yeah. need to be aware of that. I mean, they've been throwing bricks at all kinds of buildings. I'm sure Citibank somewhere must have gotten one of its glasses smashed in. Well, you know, the the banks are aware of it. I mean, the banks are, are no longer buying stock back because they can't, but they are contributing literally billions of dollars. I think Citigroup, since you mentioned it, has, has contributed a billion dollars to the, the, these different uh, efforts to, to assist people in lower income categories. But the United States is going through another massive transformation at the same time as we're dealing with all this other stuff. And that is, uh, if you take a look at the population figures of the United States, what you see is that, uh, and, and you know, when you talk about different people, different colors, everybody jumps up and down. But the Census Bureau shows that white people are not having children. Yes. So the white population is not growing, whereas people of other, if you will, backgrounds are having a lot of children. So whites are now, I think the Census Bureau is claiming, 60% of the population of the United States. All right, so what you have is this massive change in the structure of our economy from the standpoint of low-income people growing at a very rapid rate, high-income people not growing at all, and this is the friction that's created when that happens. And it's, 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 it's going to be big, and it's going to take years and years to, to, to deal with. Um, now, the, the United States is in a very perilous period because of the virus, because of the uh, current state of the economy, because of the change in demographics, because of you know the inability to get control of what's going on. The stock market doesn't care about any of it. <laughs> All the stock market cares about is money's being created, and we're going to buy stock. Let's look at your scenarios 
for the banking sector in the best possible scenario, given the background of COVID-19 shutdowns and mass unemployment, and we're going through phased reopenings. Uh, so take us through that best case right, well, scenario in the middle the best, and then the absolute worst at the end. Yeah, all right. Well, the best possible scenario is that we, we've built up a huge amount of cash uh, in the hands of uh, ordinary people, in the hands of uh, you know corporations, in literally the hands of the, the government. And that cash starts to get spent, which, which means that the economy starts to grow. There is an increased demand for goods and services to be produced. Uh, that the, the producers go to the banks to get working capital, and therefore we start to see a modest increase in interest rates, and we see, you know, a whole bunch of people working uh, productively, and the banks will make a fortune, and they'll do extraordinarily well. The mid case is the economy has a couple of quarters snap back from where it is now. Uh, because, again, you know, the economy is coming out of these problems, and it then settles down to a long period of reemploying a large number of the people who have lost their jobs up, up to this point in time. I mean, there's, if the Labor Department numbers show what? There's about 11 million more people unemployed today than there was a year ago. Um, and in that situation, the banks... They suffer, you know, some pretty significant loan losses, and they run into difficulties with, um, you know, their margins because interest rates are staying low, well, loan losses are going up, their earnings are not going to be attractive, but the earnings will go up, and the bank stocks will pretty much stay where they are, which is kind of wallowing where they are. The worst case scenario, we we get to the point where the Fed can't keep printing money. The government can't keep borrowing money, and therefore the ability to to siphon funds into, you know, the hands of the average American, to uh, get money into the hands of the corporation or the, you know, creator of goods and services, and therefore no one can pay their debts. That's an overstatement, but but a large number of people cannot pay their debts, and we're not producing anything to give them enough income so that they can grab it, get a job. The banks now start to lose huge amounts of money. They run through their capital. Some banks start to fail, and we have a depression, which lasts for, you know, a decade or more. And just to clarify, you're talking about banks based in the U.S., even global banks, correct? Well, well I'm talking about U.S. banks, but the same thing would happen all yep. around the world. And, and what's your bet? Which scenario is the most likely? I put, if you will, my, uh, if you will, forecasts are all based upon the fact that we get a one or two quarter, you know, recovery in the economy, and then we're looking at slow growth, you know, at least the next two to three years after that. So that I don't see the economy getting back to where it was prior to the COVID uh, virus until maybe 2023, 2024. And I don't think, who knows, people just, as they say, people will buy stocks no matter what, but um, because of the, the money is there to do it. But my guess, it, it's going to be a, a fairly tough, a long, tough period to get out of this. No fee-shaped recovery? No, I yeah. don't think so. No, I don't think there's a V out there. You've been listening to Life on Planet Earth with John Aiden Byrne. To reach the host or learn about advertising or sponsorship opportunities, call 973-664-9460 in the U.S. or email burndesk at gmail.com. That's 973-664-9460 in the U.S. or email burndesk at gmail.com. 973-664-9460 in the U.S. or email burndesk at gmail.com.